Stick with them together. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, it is my uh, real honor and pleasure to be uh, in a position to interview and moderate a discussion with my dear friends uh, Gustavo Cisneros and Adriana Cisneros. So please welcome them to eMERGE. Thank you very much for being here. My, my, can I say something first? Sure, we're gonna, we're, you can interrupt me anytime you want this panel. One more interruption. <laughs> uh, we're here, uh, we're very happy to be here. But I want to especially thank with Adriana, uh, Melissa, and Manny. They've done a fantastic fourth year, great organization, and we're grateful to be here. I agree. In fact, um, I at Lion Tree uh, discovered that we are an investor in eMERGE uh, as a, a conference and an investment platform as part of our merchant bank. Uh, which we're honored uh, to, uh, to be in a position to be uh, invested here because we, we very much believe not only in connectivity, uh, but also uh, Miami as an epicenter of uh, the pivot point between Latin America and the US and even Europe uh, for medium technology uh, enterprises. And uh, this family really was my uh, inspiration for getting involved in Latin America and, and the firm that uh, I founded five years ago, Lion Tree is very focused on Latin America as well as other regions in these industries. So uh, thank you for the inspiration, Adriana and Gustavo. Um, now, I know a lot of people have uh, practiced different uh, discussions when they get on stage here and probably are practicing in conference rooms and uh, maybe over the phone. Um, we had a chance to really uh, do a unique rehearsal down in the DR a few, uh, about a month ago, to talk about the strategy of uh, the region and uh, where things are going. And uh, so it was, uh, it was among friends that we were able to really rehearse and discuss naturally uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, and we're going to talk today about uh, entrepreneurialism, family businesses, and really building a media and technology enterprise for the future. And, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a way that I think while we may recount some of the history, of this uh, great family and the businesses that you've run and built, but there are very much relevant topics to discuss for today uh, because this industry is full of family controlled businesses, uh, businesses in transition, technology disruption, and I think this uh, family is a great example of how you've navigated it smoothly uh, from my perspective over the years. Um, so just a few words about the two of you before we get started because I really um, am very impressed with uh, the reach of the Cisneros Group. It's massive. Uh, the company spans over 550 million customers across 100 different countries. The Cisneros Group owns or holds interest in more than 30 companies, including Venevision, the largest TV network in Venezuela, a film and TV studio that is the largest independent producer of Spanish language programming in the US and Latin American markets, the Cisneros Media Group, which distributes entertainment content globally, a real estate development firm currently building Tropicalia, a luxury resort in the Dominican Republic, and an interactive division that has acquired and grown digital advertising startups around Latin America, which we'll talk about more. Uh, Gustavo is chairman of the Cisneros Group companies. He's on many boards. He's a mentor to, my, to myself and also is an executive in residence with, with Lion Tree. Uh, Gustavo succeeded the company from his father, Diego Cisneros, at the age of 25 years old in 1970. And as chairman and CEO, Gustavo acquired the rights to Miss Ven the Miss Venezuela beauty pageant, which has become one of the most popular beauty pageants in the world, uh, established and grew Venevision from Diego uh, as Venezuela's first private TV network, and under Gustavo's leadership became the leading producer of TV content for Spanish-speaking audiences in Latin America worldwide. And in 1992, Gustavo, along with Jerry Perenquio and Emilio Ascaraga, launched Univision, obviously the first Spanish language media company in the US. In 1995, he partnered with the Hughes Electronics Corporation to launch DirecTV Latin America, the first all digital direct to home satellite TV service in Latin America. And he, along with his wonderful wife, Patty, are very philanthropic. And uh, that is a, um, 
a uh, trait that he's passed on and they've passed on to Adriana, as we will, we will discover. Adriana became the CEO of the company at the age of 33 years old in 2013. Uh, before that, she worked at the company for eight years, really building and expanding the digital, mobile, online advertising networks, e-commerce, and social gaming areas. Um, she has now uh, overseen the company and established it into three divisions. One is the media division, two is the real estate division, and three is the interactive division, with additional businesses and consumer products and services. And Adriana notably became Facebook's first reseller in the Americas after it was named Facebook's official reseller in Ecuador, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Venezuela. She also is deeply involved in philanthropy and has prioritized social responsibility uh, over anything else and is a co-founder with Manny of Endeavor Miami, uh, which is a nonprofit that supports high impact entrepreneurship in this area and has a real passion for the region. Um, so quite accomplished in many different ways, uh, not just in building media businesses. So Gustavo, take us back to uh, the story of your father, Don Diego Cisneros, a pioneer in business. And when he started the company, it was like the Wild West. Talk about how he had the idea of starting the Cisneros Group and, and uh, how, what you learned from him. First of all, thank you. He's a good friend and he shows it. Uh, to, to come down to Miami and do this interview means a lot for me and not for Adrian. Pleasure. Thank you again. No, listen, my father was a force of nature. Uh, he arrived in Venezuela, he was half Venezuelan, half Cuban, uh, arrived in Venezuela to look at this, what, what he thought was his father's country, uh, mother's, and then he said, I'm not leaving. It was oil. Oil had come in, 1920s. It was the Wild West. Everything was open. Uh, everything had to be done. There were no roads, there was no infrastructure, there were no media, there was uh, nothing but opportunity. So he stayed. He had a brother, an older brother, who also uh, worked with him. And he very quickly, uh, he was 18 years old, by the way. 18 years old, was able to uh, have his mother co-sign uh, an IOU for one truck. That truck, transportation truck, became 200 trucks. And it became 400, and they changed it to buses, which was the truck business, was a bad business, but the bus business was great. Then they sold it. So he had enough money to travel uh, to come to Europe, to come to the United States, and to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. Luckily for her, he came back to Caracas and met my mother. And my mother, of course, came from Caracas, so they stayed from... My, my mother was a very pretty girl, and I can understand how he fell in love with her, a very sweet person. Uh, looks like you, Elizabeth, Adriana. So, uh, he said, all right, what are we going to do here in, in, in Venezuela? We're going to do different things. Things that are, are new in the United States are totally new here. So he went and got Pepsi Cola, which when he tasted, said, tasted like hell. He hated it. Medicine. And it was really medicine. As you... So he, he took it back with his brother. But that became the largest distribution business in the world because it had, at the end of the day, it had, it had uh, 65 plants, it had distribution centers, it had glass factories, uh, sugar industry, it had concentrate. So it was a big, immense distribution machine. And he had the force to do it, and the personality of his executives. When he uh, retired, my, bro my brother and my cousin Osvaldo and I took over, we realized that that was the end of his dream because Pepsi-Cola didn't realize that the value of the family. So we began to look around and we saw that Coca-Cola really wanted to partner with us. And then we partnered with Coca-Cola. Uh, that was uh, uh, big news then. And it was the right move for the family because we were able to grow out of Venezuela 
And we did the same thing. With the same team of people, we went from number one in Pepsi-Cola to being number one in Coca-Cola. Uh, Adriana saw that when we signed in Atlanta. So it's a, it's a good history. We have the management, and uh, we still do. But I think as an entrepreneur, um, it's unusual to uh, do two things that Diego did uh, at starting the company. One is to start a company through partnership, yep. to bring in a partnership with Pepsi-Cola, and two is to do it on a global scale. Um, he was one of the first to really move outside of Venezuela to Brazil and other markets and create more of a global perspective of that partnership. Well, he always created a love brands, uh, and he first grew into Colombia, and then Brazil, so very successful. And of, and of course, uh, he continued doing that when we, he went into the television business in Venezuela. There was a, a network called Televisa, I was having great many problems, he was able to buy it. And he, I went with him on that trip. He talked to Leonard Goldenson, uh, who was uh, chairman of ABC, uh, American Broadcasting Corporation in New York City. And uh, Leonard said, what do you need, Diego? I said, well, he says, I want to be in this business, I don't know anything about it, but can you help me? And they took 20%. So we had all the backing of ABC, plus all the contracts, plus all the know-how. And I was able to train with, in Leonard's office. Uh, it's not so easy today, but that's the sort of thing that he was able to do. So he lived very different brands. And afterwards, we continue doing that. So brand Adriana, after brand after brand. So Adriana, we're going to get to the chronology of it all, but is that underlying DNA still in the company about working in partnership, focusing on brands, having a global perspective? Absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm doing anything differently than what my grandfather started doing and what my father continued doing. Um, there's actually been very little innovation um, in our strategy even though our company is almost 90 years old. The way that we structured our interactive business, even though you might think is very different, uh, where we've been building what today is the largest digital ad network in Latin America, which ultimately led us to become Facebook's only reseller in the world, not only in Latin America. Um, is I, I used the basic architecture from the deals that I studied that my father was putting together in the 80s and the 90s and the 70s that he was basing on the architecture from the deals that my grandfather was putting together in the 30s and the 40s. Yeah, it's clear. And it's not only about the uh, entrepreneurial focus around the partnerships and the brands and staying with a tried and tested strategy over the 90 years, let's say, uh, but it's also being willing to transition in businesses. So when, you, when, when your father went from Pepsi and the partnership there to the TV business. Take us through the uh, lineage of, of how that happened, and that's a pretty uh, remarkable change from a beverage business into a television business. Well, he first, he had that partnership with ABC, so he found a group of people who could help him uh, at a moment's notice. If he needed technicians, or he needed product, or he needed talent, that he could get. Then he, had, he sent out to the United States a group of executives uh, to be trained for fully two years. Then he sent me out to Hollywood and I had the best time. <laughs> then he, uh, he made sure that everyone who came in into the business knew uh, was absolutely in love with the business because it was a 24 by 24 hour. It's like your business, you know, on, online, on time all the time. So people were very motivated. We were lucky in a way because uh, Castro had come to power and there was a big group of uh, executives who came over from Semecu, which was a Mestre family owned television company in Cuba and we were able to absorb all of them, all the ones we wanted, and they were the best in the world. So we were also a mixture of this, that and the other. And Adriana, when you think about building the company now, uh, do you 
easily think about new areas of growth, like obviously the real estate area or other areas that you've developed since you took over? I do, because when I see of our, I see our history. So, yeah, you know, my grandfather built Venevision, which at the, six, at the time was the sixth TV network in the world. You know, it was pretty early to do that privately. And then my father took that knowledge and he ended up helping the Santo Domingos build Caracol in Colombia. And then he went to Chile and he built in Chile the first national TV networks because the Chileans hadn't figured out how to deal with the mountain range. But he did it with this team of phenomenal engineers. And from there, he decided to do Univision in the United States. And with that knowledge, he went into the satellite business by launching DirecTV in, the in, in all of Latin America. And I grew up seeing this sort of approach to going big early and always betting very large in Latin America. That's the script that, I, that we followed. So the interesting thing of, of when we started talking about possibly me taking over the, the company was that he was giving me a lot of space to map out the kind of company that I wanted to run. And one of the areas that I noticed that was really interesting to me was this whole digital space. And we started having this conversation about there's a lot of digital traffic out there. And the insights we were having about digital traffic came because we understood the media business really well. It was just moving onto a different kind of platform. And we started talking about how can we set up a company that helps us monetize all this digital traffic, both in the US Hispanic market, which was the market that we understood because of Univision. And if we're gonna do it in Univision, how can we set up a company that also helps us monetize all this digital traffic in Latin America? So it became very clear what we needed to do. And we set up a new vertical called Cisneros Interactive that is very focused and specializes in being able to do that. So it's not a radical departure. It's not a brand new venture. For us, in the conversation that we had, it was a very logical transition. Uh, there is, there's a, it's a very step-by-step -step, uh, conversation, you know, that, that goes from Venevision to Facebook, actually. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was, growing up, I was glued to my father. Same as Adriana is glued to me. So, it, <laughs> Crazy glue. <It, it>, <laughs> somehow, somehow, it works. Yeah. Well, when you have a strong foundation of both an entrepreneurial gene and a family trust together, you can have a longer-term perspective. And I think things start to flow more logically than, and opportunistically, it sounds like, than just uh, in a more haphazard way that's not well thought out. And I, and I want to talk about being an entrepreneur within a family business a little bit, because Gustavo, you were one of eight children, or uh, one of, uh, you had eight siblings or one of eight children? One of eight. One of eight children. And you number were number four. You were number four out of eight, right in the middle. And when you were 25 years old, your father said, um, we'd like for you to be uh, the new CEO of the business. So I know now, looking back, probably why it happened, but were you thinking at the time, why me? Uh, correct. I mean, I told Father I, I really didn't want to do it. I wanted to go on my own. But he had got uh, sick. Uh, but he was, uh, you know, in a very good frame of mind, and it was a family decision. Uh, and we all agreed on it. So I was expected to take it. But I did happily, and um, it, worked, it worked very well. Uh, we made it work because we grew. We grew the businesses every area, so every brother had a lot of things to do. Uh, and we then began to grow in the United States. And that was an immense step also. We, uh, we took, uh, we bought a company called All American, uh, which was the 10th largest bottling company here. And we did extremely well. We, I did it with Teddy Forsman, one of the first private equity deals. And then I, we bought a company called uh, Spalding, which was, we made it into the number one company in the world, which wasn't. And a company called Evenflow, which was the number two or three baby products company, and we made it into the first one. Uh, we transferred all the assets to China, one of the first Chinese deals, uh, American Chinese deals, and that worked very well. So we had that immense capacity to also to grow and to come to the United States and to 
uh, be part of the American, North American uh, well, footprint, Canada, United States, Latin America. But how did, where did you get the skill set to be a CEO? I mean, at a young age, did, you, did your father give you any lessons or did you automatically say we have to well, I was, grow? Uh, thinking back, I was glued to him. I saw everything he did. I used to be his shadow, his secretary. I think he didn't like Adriana. Without really realizing, I was, I was on the story. Uh, of course, it's in the genes, obviously, but we had very capable brothers. So it was my father who picked me. Uh, I had no choice. So what he showed me, I think it was a, uh, that I was going to have the capacity to be patient, to be a leader for the long term, and to take everybody's opinion into consideration. Family helps. Uh, because I have a, a real deep feel about family. And I think Adriana also has that. And did, how did that, did that inform your decision to uh, pass the torch and the mantle to Adriana at, a, at the age of 33, and she's the youngest of three and the only woman in, uh, among her siblings, and um, had to be uh, obviously taking it on at a young age as well. How did you think well, about that decision? I wanted to do it earlier. Uh, and actually, Adriana had this discussion three years earlier and said, I said, no, I'm not ready yet. So we waited three years, and we went to a very... It was a long conversation. It was a three-year conversation that we had in secret. Him and I were the only, and our former CEO, Steve Bundell, had this three-year conversation to see whether I was ready or not to take the job. And during this conversation, what I said was, listen, let's do this. Let me become director of strategy, which was a position that we invented. It had never existed in our company. And it was amazing, because it gave me full access to every meeting and every company that we had. No one felt threatened, because no one had the slightest idea what it was that I was supposed to be doing. But in, the, but in those three years, it gave me all the insights that I needed to be able to present to my father and Stephen, without knowing if I actually wanted the job, how I thought that we needed to restructure our company so that it could be successful in the next 20 years. And when I presented them to the, with the plan, they said, OK, we really like the plan, but you have to own the plan. And they actually let me implement the new vision and the new structure, which was pretty radical. It went from having 28 direct reports to having three, uh, which is the company that I'm running now. They said, go for it. We like it. Implement it. But you have to become CEO. So that was our journey. But I was very old in comparison to him when I took over. So. She was very mature already. Uh, and. Uh, I wanted to do it earlier because I wanted to, you have to do this when you're strong. When you have a, a family uh, like ours, you have to be strong, you have to be decisive. And, and I wanted to be a very active chairman. So I wanted to see her work, develop, even have conflicts. Uh, if I had made a mistake, I could have you know, told her, okay, we made a mistake so far. No mistakes have been made. So far, so good. Yeah. And, and Adriana, when, as a young CEO, you have the benefit of having a very long-term perspective. And obviously, as a private company on top of that, with yep. a family dynamic, uh, it's even an added edge, or uh, I'd say advantage, that uh, the Stenos Group has. So talk about how that informs your innovation, your development of businesses, and also tie it into the Cisneros Interactive Group, which you built up from the ground up and how you need to have a long-term perspective really to take that long journey. Yeah, it's, um, I think this is, it's a really interesting topic. And um, rhythm uh, and cycles um, is one of those conversations that's really fun to have with bankers because we tend to drive them absolutely crazy. You know, you and I talk about this all the time. I'm always playing the long game. And the long game for me is, I, I am thinking of the next 30, 40, and 50 years. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm not, I don't have a plan that's six months and a year in front of me. And with interactive specifically, it's a really interesting place to explain that, right? So my interactive business um, has a very short cycle. We invest and divest out of eight, 10, 12 companies every year because the technologies that we're working with and building up are changing every six months. So to keep fresh and on top of the game, 
we have to be able to move very, very quickly. That doesn't mean that I'm not thinking about the health of my overall company for the next 30 years. I report to my siblings, to my father, this is a family business that we intend to keep for a very long time. But I am certain that 30 years from now, my company is going to look radically different from the company that I'm running today. And most people have a very hard time understanding how those two worlds can, co can coexist. I really don't. What I like about being able to play the long game is that it makes you behave in a way that is what I believe the only way in the right way. When you know that you're going to be in the same neighborhood with your same neighbors playing the same game for the next 10, 20, and 30 years, you behave correctly, you invest in the well-being of your community, and you want to make sure that everything that you're doing is going to be good for everybody and all the stakeholders. And I think that's a very powerful way of playing the good game that's good for everyone. Yeah, I remember the first time I met you, I was in, a, in, an audi in the audience of a panel you were doing at the Paley Center, and you were asked about you know, what kind of models you're looking at, and you were the only one on the panel that said that you have a 20-year model. Yeah. And uh, obviously we all say, who knows what happens in 20 years, but the fact that you have the luxury of thinking that far ahead uh, maybe informs your capital deployment strategies and your, and your investment strategies. For it sure. certainly does. And I think you know, for us, Latin America is really the region that I'm focused on. I think 80% of my business is in Latin America, and it's, it's, I'm very optimistic about our region. And you know, Latin America does have cycles. It always has, and it always will. And when you can play the long game, it's much easier to feel comfortable in Latin America, especially when you have the benefit of being able to have offices in a lot of countries in Latin America. Thus, you can survive the cycles with a lot of peace instead of, instead of being really stressed out. And Adriana, we know for, if you look at any balance sheet of any US or European corporation, where they really make their money is in Latin America. That's where the profits come from. Yeah. They lose it in the United States, they lose it in Europe, they put it into China, they lose it, but where they make the money every year is in Latin America. So, we know that. So, we're in a safe continent. Please invest in Latin America. <laughs> um, well, you, you have had a uh, influence beyond just the business strategy, uh, which is a effect of being in hundred different countries and having a business over 90 years and, and having a stellar reputation, uh, both of you. Um, but, and I can verify the reasons why from knowing you personally. But now that you look ahead over the next few years, uh, Gustavo, what do you think the key challenges are? And, and then maybe Adriana, where you would play those opportunities as a result of those challenges? Economically or politically? Let's start uh, macro, politically. Well, macro, first of all, uh, we have to make this government work. Uh, Trump got elected for the right reasons. I think people were very tired of Obama and, and what all of Obama implied, the regulations and the top-heavy government and top-heavy taxes. And all of you understand that because you're entrepreneurs here. So he represents an entrepreneur. For the first time in the history of the United States, there's one entrepreneur in the White House. So uh, every time I see a person like Ari, who I know has connections, I said, make sure you spend time in Washington. Make sure you spend time in the White House. Make sure you get your voice uh, heard. Because it's important to make this work. This government is going to deregulate. It's already doing it. This government is going to lower taxes. This government is going to make it uh, much easier for us, for entrepreneurs. And this is, a, I think, the time to, for all of us to get involved somehow, either we're our friends or our chambers or whoever we call a friend, to influence in a the, in the good way. Uh, if uh, President Trump had a filter in the morning, uh, maybe Ivanka, perhaps, could be great, but he doesn't. That's what he does. He wants to be created, 33 million people. But those messages are mostly very, very good. Mostly very good for all of you. And the markets show it. Uh, some Europeans had 
some worries when he came in and I sat with them. I said, look at the stock market. Look what's happening in the United States. For the first time, entrepreneurs are happy. That, that's, that's what's happening. These are entrepreneurs betting their life savings, um, betting uh, five years profit in, in the market. It's because they believe in what Trump is trying to do. So I am very optimistic about uh, the economy in the United States. And I'm also very optimistic because it's going to show the rest of the world that a business-oriented business government can be very, very good for the economy. It could, it's going to be for, for France, it's going to be good for England, for, for Germany, extremely good for Latin America. For instance, let me give you for instance. Uh, Obama had a very, very uh, linear, um, granular idea about Latin America. He wanted good relations with Cuba and good relations with Colombia because he wanted a peace treaty in Colombia. Two things. What he signed in Cuba is not a very good deal. It, he, didn't, he didn't ask for anything. And what, it, what the Colombians had to give up to sign the deal is enormous. And he forgot that with the rest of Latin America. Since, believe it or not, since oh, President Trump came to power, the 10 things people like me have asked uh, the, the government of the United States to do, he's done them. Not only 10, he's done 10 more. So I'm very optimistic because they're doing all the right things they have to do in regards to Latin America. So if you look at Canada, the United States, and Latin America, I think we're going we're gonna to have the best five years ever because so, of that. So Gustavo, you view the political environment as, and the risks around that as more noise, but really a big opportunity. Well, you have, you have the best president of Argentina now. You have, uh, he's done the same thing. He's, uh, it, he, uh, Macri in Argentina is like having Trump. Uh, he le makes less noise, but he's doing all the same thing. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski in Peru, same thing. Uh, the Mexican reforms are already in place. So if you look, and by the way, Brazil. How many companies do we have in Brazil? Uh, Three. Three companies. They're growing faster than ever. So something good is happening in Brazil because they're cleaning up the place. So if you add Mexico, and you add Brazil, and you add... The, uh, uh, Peru, uh, that's 90% of the economy, 95% of the economy. And you add Canada, and you add the United States, it's a big pool to play with. So you're optimistic, Andre, and I won't uh, uh, have you go back and forth on the political environment, but talk about the economic and business opportunities that you see ahead now, uh, given the portfolio of companies that you have and the different business divisions. I mean, what are you most excited about investing in for the next uh, few decades? Thank you. Yeah, so we, we are extremely optimistic about Latin America. Our, we actually have offices in every single country in Latin America, which is amazing. I spend a lot of time, all my time, on American Airlines. I have too many miles, which I'm not proud of. Um, and our biggest offices are in Colombia um, and in Argentina. And I, I love spending time there. Um, I would say, you know, what, what keeps me up, up at, at, at night is what's happening at home in Venezuela. And I think for all, us, all of us here, what we have to do every day is to remember that it's our responsibility to defend the democratic principles that are the only principles by which we can ensure that the health of the continent stays in check. Um, and it's in our hands to ensure that our continent stays healthy. Um, it's a really, really exciting time. And the Hispanic market in the United States is a big part of that conversation. And the dialogue between the economy of the Hispanic market and Latin America is really, really exciting. So we think it's, it's going to be an amazing couple of years ahead of us. And the silver lining is that we got you to be based in Miami and Coral Gables. And uh, the company is obviously uh, centered around Miami across the the region. So uh, thank you both for thank being you, here Ari. and thank you for having us at the EMOS conference. Thank you, Ari.